commentary, and here I will be dealing with some of the important and interesting radiological cases which will be seen a transition from neuroanatomy to neuroradiology, and it will be a very interesting topic, I hope, and I would like to have your uh, criticism or your views at the end of it. Uh, so going straight away to the topic over here. <clears throat> Interesting patterns in the parenchyma neuroradiological cases. I would just like to mention two to three things over here. First of all, I thank my radiological team, the radiography team, the radiological units concerned with the preparation of this presentation, number one. And number two, these are all copyright images, and I hope that you will take proper care about those. These are cases which we have seen in our lifetime, and I will be presenting them to you so that you have a bit of a view how interesting neuroradiology is. So first of all, just going to the case one. Aquastic neuroma. So over here, you can see that there is a lesion and we are well aware of an anatomical entity, CPA, cerebellopontine angle. And in relation to the cerebellopontine angle, unfortunately, sometimes we have certain masses, solid and nodular which arise and they are given the name as aquastic neuroma. Basically, aquastic neuromas are also given the name as schwannomas, especially vestibular schwannomas. Why vestibular? Because they lie in relation with the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibulocochlear nerve, especially the superior division. So vestibular schwannoma, aquastic neuroma, they are one and the same thing. And seen in relation to CPA, and presenting radiologically as solid nodular masses. But sometimes they can have an issue of degeneration or hemorrhage occurring within these masses. Now, usually they are solitary, but sometimes in relation to certain important conditions like neurofibromatosis type 2, we have got the bilateral aquastic schwannomas, a classic of NF2. So that's very important. Usually, schwannomas happen to be benign, and you can see our religion over here. This is the aquastic neuroma or the vestibular schwannoma. And what is important, they usually tend to be benign. They are not malignant usually. And another important thing is that they just present with hearing loss and tinnitus. So ENT surgeons and ENT physicians just get these cases. And in addition to that, pathologists they recognize Antony A and Antony B patterns in aquastic neuroma. So this is one lesion, aquastic neuroma, not that rare, and we get a lot many cases in the subcontinent with aquastic neuroma. So remember this picture, a very important case, aquastic neuroma. Now, second thing is that we have got, you can see our here, this is a transition from neuroradiology uh, I mean to say neuroanatomy, the word something which is pathological or which is something I mean to say physiological. So basically once a person ages, we get cortical atrophy and the sulci and the gyre of the brain begin to shrink. So you can see over here a simple radiological picture representing the atrophy of the sulci and the gyre. Very important. Now this is common. You see that there are certain cases of dementia, Alzheimer's dementia in old age. But we have got uh, variants of Alzheimer's dementia, like the presenile dementia, presenile cortical dementia. And in addition to that, dementia is not restricted to uh, Alzheimer's only. We have mid multi infarct dementia. We have got the Levy body dementia and Christopher Jacobson disease, wherein we have the dementia. But over here, to notice is the cortical atrophy, the atrophy of the sulci and gyre, which we are seeing over here. So very important a normal physiological or a pathological process which you can see and this is a representation of cortical atrophy. Now we come across a very very I mean to say sophisticated thing which is the AVM atriovenous malformations and atriovenous malformations you can see this patch over here and what you can notice in this patch is a disorganized vascular pattern so there is the uh, I mean, say disorganization of the vessels over here. There is this can be, I mean, to say development or this can be acquired. But many of the cases of cerebral AVMs are, I mean, to say uh, congenital 
and it is a developmental mall formation used usually and what we classically see over here a bag of worm type of an appearance so you can see this area over here looks like a bag of worm and in here we can have uh, important features a uh, patient or a child or an adult will be presenting with bleeding or he or she can present with a mass effect or he or she can present with seizures so that is very very important and the bag of worms appearance is very much important and these cerebral avms uh, may remain there but sometimes they can bleed and rupture and cause intracranial hemorrhage and in addition to that they can cause a steel phenomena that they just drain away the blood from the vital parts of the brain so making other areas of the brain susceptible to ischemia so cerebral avms they are just clicking time bombs like the cerebral aneurysms and i will not go into the cerebral aneurysms over here but remember this important uh, diagram and this is the cerebral avm now from the cerebral avm what we have sometimes you can see our hair a lesion over here a lesion over here and the lesion spread ar around the frontal lobes so frontoparietal involvement over here and what are these millet like or some e-shaped nodules these happen to be brain mets metastasis to the brain from a primary lesion elsewhere and what are the brain mets usually found they are seen in relation to the lung ca to the i mean to say cancers from the other parts of the body like the breast ca like the melanomas the malignancies from the gi tract and the kidney so brain is a very important fertile area wherein we have the brain mets from these different organ systems and patients usually present with headache seizure or weakness depending upon the area of the brain which is involved along with the cognitive decline so in most of the cases uh, once the mets are there in the brain it is a late stage disease uh, and one has to take precautions according to the uh, i mean say presentation and the primary so the treatment modalities differ so this is how the brain mets would look very important thing which you can just notice now in addition to that over here you can see a lesion over here and this is the craniopharyngioma and what is craniopharyngioma craniopharyngioma usually presents as a benign it is not malignant many of the times it is cystic and it is cellar i mean to say that you know the cella tersica and in this region you have got the tumor which is the cellar tumor and over here the craniopharyngioma embryologically you know the ratkes pouch and this craniopharyngioma usually originates from the ratkes pouch and usually they are big i mean to say giant and multilobular so this is a presentation of the craniopharyngioma a very important brain tumor which is seen i am not talking here about other brain tumors like the astrocytomas the glioblastoma multiforme and other things so this is specifically the craniopharyngioma now uh, over here you see this is the calvaria the skull cap and over here uh, a very interesting uh, case and you will see uh, this is not the i'm not talking about the brain mets this is the calvarial metastasis so over here the calvarial metastasis they can be local and they can be uh, sometimes they can be from different parts as well but over here you notice that this is the area of the calvarial metastasis not that common and that's why i have put it over here so this is the outer diploic space the inner diploic space and you have this calvaria and you can see a well uh, uh marked lesion over here uh projection in the uh, between the diploi and this is the calvarial metastasis now uh this uh, lesion over here the arachnoid cyst arachnoid you know the meninges of the brain you know the dura mater the arachnoid and the pia mater and over here you have got the arachnoid cyst and what is it it is a cystic fluid filled cavity and usually it is seen in relation as a Uh, acquired or a congenital anomaly some of the times and in addition to that where sometimes the patient usually they are asymptomatic and only the uh, larger cysts require uh, uh, i mean to surgical intervention so these are quite benign and usually they should be monitored by repeated radiographic techniques and this is something which arises from a, a meninge and it is a bag filled cystic region over here so that's important now important thing over here is another brain tumor usually benign and we give it the name as meningioma and you can see a 
lesion over here. This is the meningioma, usually benign, and they comprise about the 30% of the brain tumors. And in addition to that, uh, you see that they arise from the arachnoid capsules within the dura mater. So that's very important. And there's a dural tail associated with the meningiomas usually, which is not seen here. And many of the time they are calcified. They are primarily benign, but they can undergo a malignant transformation. And around the tumor, usually you see periorbit, peritumoral edema. So meningiomas happen to be benign and they can be present at any location of the brain in the frontal lobe over here. You see it in the parietal lobe and they can be present occipital. But the management depends upon the location. In case they are related uh, in relation to the vital areas, then we have to excise them. In case uh, they are not, uh, uh, I mean to say, seen in relation to vital areas, we can manage them conservatively, monitor them, and there are so many latest techniques, Brahma knife and all those things with which they are, I mean to say, removed, and we can just monitor their progress of the therapies uh, uh, timely. So meningioma over here. Now, in addition to this, very rarely you are well aware of this parasite, Echinococcus, and Echinococcus is usually infects the liver, and uh, many a times, other than liver, a rare area is the lung, and then we have the bones, and in very, very rare cases, we have the brain, which is affected by the high uh, disease. We can have disseminated hydrotosis, and in which many of the parts of the body are uh, affected, but brain is a very, very rare region. So you have this hydrated cyst over here, and hydrated cyst presents as a cystic, a smooth, a smooth membrane, and Usually, I told you, liver, lungs, kidney are affected, and only 1-2% to of the lesions are seen in brain, and that in selected geographical locations like the Mediterranean area. And as far as echinococcus is concerned, we are well aware it has got its uh, dissemination through the portal venous system, and from the portal venous system, it can just affect other parts, and brain is very, very rarely affected. And patients can present with headaches, seizures, a mass effect in case the and usually the treatment depends upon uh, many factors, the susceptibility to rupture, because in case the hydrated uh, uh, cyst ruptures in any location, it can cause a massive anaphylaxis, and the modality uh, treatments differ depending upon the size, the location, and the complicating factors. So this is hydrated cyst of the brain, and these were some of the uh, important, interesting cases which were there, and I hope to come up with some more important cases, more interesting cases, so that uh, my faculty, my uh, uh, students, uh, myself, I get educated by these things, and I hope to continue these things, and I wish you best of luck for your uh, academic uh, uh, adventures. Thanks a lot, and have a happy belated new year.